Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Project Cumulus How Hacks Unfold webinar here presented by BitGlass. Uh, my name is Salim Hafid. I'm a product marketing manager here at BitGlass. Uh, and so a few things up front before we, we dive into, uh, you know, how hacks unfold and how you can protect from uh, these sorts of breaches due to leak credentials, uh, as we discovered in our Project Cumulus experiment. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we'll post an email to replay shortly after it's uh, finished. So uh, if you'd like to view that, you can. Uh, attachments are available to download. You can click the attachments button at the top of your screen. Uh, a few documents there that you might be interested in. Uh, if you have questions, we'll address them uh, after the webinar is completed. So uh, please feel free to submit those as well. Uh, and we'll have a poll during the webinar, so do feel free to uh, participate in that and give your input and uh, We'll be sure to uh, to incorporate that into the to the presentation, make this a little interactive for you. So uh, let's dive right in here and talk a little bit about Project Cumulus. You know what it is, uh, what our research team here at Big Glass did, uh, and what we discovered with this experiment. So a bit of background on the experiment. Uh, about a year ago, we conducted uh, something called the Where's Your Data experiment, where we leaked. Uh, actual documents, spreadsheets and CSV files, and uh, watermarked those documents so that we could uh, track them, track them as they uh, moved across the dark web and see who downloaded them, what the IP addresses were, uh, and where they were being downloaded from, right? So uh, what we discovered in this original experiment was a large number of uh, crime syndicates in countries like Russia uh, who were going in and, and finding these files on the dark web and downloading them. Uh, so we decided this time to, to go a step further with Project Cumulus. And so uh, the experiment here, uh, we wanted to see what happens when credentials are leaked. So uh, our research team actually went about creating a complete online identity uh, for a fictitious bank employee. So uh, we had this, this, uh, this victim that we created. Uh, we created, you know, everything from social media accounts to, uh, to online accounts and uh, Google Drive and, and other cloud apps. Uh, and we created seemingly real files for the Google Drive. So in the Google Drive, there were uh, a number of documents that, that you would imagine a bank employee would have, right? A lot of uh, work product, a lot of, you know, uh, spreadsheets uh, encrypted with uh, credit card information, that sort of thing, account numbers, customer information. Uh, so these, uh, a lot of these files were actually uh, real, real credit card numbers, right? We actually put real credit card numbers into... Uh, into this Google Drive uh, and leaked to those credentials. So the credentials we leaked were actually the Google Drive credentials belonging to this uh, bank employee. And so we leaked uh, these credentials uh, across the dark web uh, and on the surface web and saw just how fast those credentials spread, uh, the results of which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and uh, it's really incredible just the speed at which, you know, once this data is leaked, uh, how many hackers go about uh, logging into Google Drive uh, and actually uh, go about finding other accounts belonging to this victim. So we also created this uh, very convincing retail bank web portal. So, um, you know, the same as, you know, if you had a Bank of America account or what have you, uh, you have a portal to, to log into your banking information. We created that uh, as well to see uh, if hackers would, would find uh, this victim's uh, bank, not only find their bank, but uh, attempt to use the credentials that we leaked uh, on this, this uh, bank web portal. So we leaked the username and password onto the dark web uh, and, uh, and observed and tracked activity, uh, not just on the Google Drive, but also on this uh, bank victim, this bank employee's other accounts, uh, and observed as uh, many hackers from uh, many, many countries uh, logged in and, and took actions uh, on these different accounts. So a quick poll here before we uh, dive into the results of, of the uh, Project Cumulus experiment. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd love to know what actions you'd expect were most common uh, among hackers once they successfully logged into Google Drive. So we actually saw many, many hackers who viewed those credentials on the dark web log into that Google Drive account. Uh, and so uh, a few possible answer choices here, file downloads, file views, uh, password resets, uh, or crawling the drive with third-party apps, feel free to vote there. 
uh, we actually saw some all of these activities uh, occur on the Google Drive uh, as as hackers came and 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 logged into the account. And so, um, you know, everything from file downloads to file views to these password resets and these activities, we'd say, uh, are are fairly uh, common things that, that you might do if you uh, you know had a, a Google Drive account and, and were you know, except for things like password resets or crawling the drive via third-party apps, right? These are things that the hackers are doing to uh, maybe uncover changes uh, within the drive, right? So, um, and the password resets, of course, uh, just an attempt to keep other hackers from, from accessing that data that, that you think is sensitive uh, as a hacker. Uh, so let's look at these results here. Uh, yes, a lot of people thought password resets were the go-to, and, and, you know, that's sort of what we expected as well, right? We thought that uh, a lot of hackers would see these credentials uh, on the dark web, log in, find that they can log in successfully using those credentials, and then change the password so that only they can access that information until uh, that breach is discovered. Uh, a lot of people also said uh, to crawl the drive via third-party apps and, and file downloads. And you can you can imagine why file downloads would maybe be uh, a little less common uh, just because hackers see a lot of risk in that, right? Uh, they know probably that, uh, that Google Drive tracks things like downloads uh, and, uh, and that if a bank were to uh, uncover a breach, uh, they would go through their logs and... Uh, look and see who downloaded the files, especially when it comes to things like credit card information, uh, and uh, and perhaps pursue some sort of uh, uh, civil suit against these hackers uh, if they were able to identify them. So you can imagine uh, why some hackers might be hesitant to, to download these files. But of course, crawling the drive via third-party apps uh, to see if there are any changes and to maybe, um, you know, determine whether or not this is a legitimate uh, account uh, you might expect to be uh, fairly common as well. So let's dive into the results here. So we discovered that hackers move incredibly fast, right? Uh, we, we saw eight attempted logins in the first 24 hours, and uh, we actually leaked these credentials over the holidays. So, um, you know, eight attempted logins in 24 hours uh, over the holiday. Uh, first file downloaded in 48 hours. So that's, you know, the, the first hacker that was willing to, to take that risk and, and actually go and download one of these sensitive uh, bank files or what they believe to be a bank file uh, within 48 hours, so incredibly quickly. Uh, and then actually a third of the total views and logins we saw in week one. Uh, and so you can see it was uh, fairly even throughout, but, you know, it's, it really uh, speaks to just how quickly uh, banks and other organizations have to act. Uh, in order to to prevent these these breaches from from spreading, right? So uh, once those credentials are leaked, you have a third uh, of the total hackers that that accessed the Google Drive already accessed it within the first week. So uh, within one week, you know, you have hundreds of people who have already seen that information, uh, you know, all of that that customer data, uh, the customer data that we stored on the Google Drive uh, was was accessed or viewed during this time. Uh, and uh, or downloaded in, in the case of a few hackers. So this is a very interesting, uh, you know, finding that, that we had in our Project Cumulus experiment, the uh, hacked once, hacked everywhere uh, finding. We created a number of accounts, not just on cloud applications, but also uh, this fake bank web portal that we created uh, and a number of uh, social media accounts that we created for this bank employee to, to give him some sort of legitimacy. Uh, and so the victim, uh, this, this fictitious bank employee we created, uh, used the same password across the web. So we actually, uh, the same password that, that we leaked uh, for the Google Drive was also used uh, by the employee uh, on his retail bank account, also used on other social media accounts. Uh, and this is actually fairly common, right? You have uh, a lot of people who, you know, don't want the hassle of dealing with multiple passwords. They don't have some kind of password management software, so they just use one password or uh, some, you know, very simple variation on one password. And, uh, incredibly common. Uh, and so we just wanted to, to see uh, if that would translate into sort of risk in the real world. Uh, and, uh, and it did. 94% uh, of hackers uncovered other accounts and 36% of the uh, Google Drive 
hackers who successfully logged into the Google Drive also successfully accessed the victim's bank account. So uh, just think about that for a minute, if you, if you will. Uh, you know, you have these credentials leaked to a cloud application that has nothing to do with your personal banking, right? And you have uh, these leaks of these different services all the time, right? You see things like the, uh, the Anthem or, or Primera breach uh, where you have uh, medical records leaked, but you also have uh, oftentimes you have password leaks uh, from, from all different uh, sources. So uh, when folks are using the same password across these, these many different services, uh, you, you can't expect that the damage will be limited to just that application, right? Or that, that the risk is just that someone will log into the uh, application that, that suffered the breach. Uh, oftentimes, hackers see those uh, leaked credentials and try to use them elsewhere. And so here we see 94% of hackers uncover other accounts, 36% of which uh, were the bank account, right? So uh, imagine you use the same password on your uh, on your on your Twitter, or, uh, YouTube, or Facebook account. Something that's uh, not super sensitive, but still very important, and something you want to keep you know uh, close to the vest. Uh, but imagine one of those passwords is leaked, and imagine you use the same password uh, on in, in your bank account or for a cloud application belonging to your organization. Uh, you use it for your your Salesforce login, or you use it for your uh, your Dropbox or what have you. And uh, and as we see here, it's incredibly common that hackers will, will take that password and try to use it elsewhere. Uh, and uh, and Or even use some variation of that password, right? We saw a lot of uh, login challenges on the Google Drive where uh, hackers wouldn't use the exact same password but something slightly different. And so you have that sometimes where uh, hackers are uh, uncovering other accounts and attempting to use uh, your password or a variation on your password uh, to access other accounts. So that really speaks to the importance uh, of having many different passwords for, for all your different accounts and making sure that those passwords are secure, uh, uh, are, you know, complex and, you know, have, have all the, the hallmarks of uh, security best practices, uh, but also that you have other means of authentication in place, right? That you, you, a lot of these services offer things like uh, multi-factor authentication, and we'll talk about ways that you can uh, improve authentication in your organization in a moment. Uh, but this really just shows that, that once you're hacked once, hacked on one account, uh, because of the, um, the reuse of passwords across these multiple accounts, uh, you can be hacked everywhere just from that one uh, breach. So another interesting finding was the uh, the Tor usage, uh, and this is Tor usage on the rise year over year compared to our previous uh, Where's Your Data experiment that I talked about earlier. So uh, here we saw hackers come from over 30 countries, uh, and that's, you know, 30 countries across six continents. You had people in the U.S., people in, uh, people in, in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, people in Latin America, people in Australia. Uh, so really just everywhere across the globe. Uh, and you had 68% of the hackers uh, who logged into Google Drive actually logged in via Tor. And uh, this is a very interesting finding in that uh, in our previous experiment, uh, it was actually relatively few users uh, downloaded the files that we had leaked uh, with Tor or some other means of uh, of masking their identity, right? And so this really shows that in just one year, uh, hackers have become increasingly sophisticated, uh, increasingly capable of, you know, masking their identity, of, uh, of ensuring that they don't get caught when they, when they try to access these files. And so you have 68% of these hackers uh, who logged into Google Drive via Tor, and for those hackers we saw, uh, we saw IP addresses of exit nodes, right? So we were... Uh, tracking all activity, uh, not just on the bank web portal, but also on this Google Drive and also on these other accounts. Uh, and so 68% uh, of those logins from the Google Drive uh, came from, from IP addresses that we identified uh, as Tor exit nodes. And so you still had a large number of people uh, log into these accounts uh, without Tor, right, or without VPN. And, and so we, um, for those, you know, for those, that's how we uh, have the, the hackers from 30 countries is 
uh, those folks who did not take those extra security measures uh, as hackers and uh, and go about uh, logging in, you know, from from their home or their work or what have you, uh, without Tor, right? So, um, but we do have 68%, a large number, uh, the vast majority of hackers now smart enough to go and uh, and log in with Tor. So, uh, very interesting was uh, were a number of the comments that we saw. Right, we posted a lot of these things on the uh, on the dark web on you know dark web forums. Uh, dark web communities, and, and we saw it, you know, get shared very quickly, right? So you had, you know, credentials posted in one place, uh, and very quickly the hackers would take it upon themselves to uh, to share the thread or to, to, you know, to comment on the what they saw as the uh, legitimacy or, or lack thereof of uh, of some some element here, right? Either the bank website or the uh, files in the Google Drive or what have you. And uh, but we did notice a lot of discussion about tactics and um, you know the ways in which a hacker would go about uh, safely and securely accessing these files without getting caught. And it's uh, these are very interesting uh, results that we saw. Uh, you know, Tor and VPN and cryptocurrency uh, combined as one sort of method advocated by some of these uh, dark web hackers. Right, a lot of them said that the Tor, uh, especially for a novice hacker who uh, maybe doesn't have um, as, as sophisticated or as a, uh, or as deep an understanding of how to go about doing this without getting caught, uh, a lot of uh, sort of the more experienced hackers suggested using Tor in conjunction uh, with a VPN service purchased with cryptocurrency. Right, it's so very hard to track if you're using cryptocurrency to purchase the VPN. Uh, and then logging in uh, through Tor, uh, through the VPN service, uh, not only does your uh, internet service provider not know that you're uh, that you're accessing Tor, but also that uh, that uh, that even if you know the Tor exit node uh, didn't exist, you would still appear to be coming from somewhere else, and there's no way to trace it back to you if you're using cryptocurrency. So uh, some very smart thinking there from a lot of these uh, these hackers. Also, the bank trojans was a big suggestion, and uh, you know we had a few security measures in place on the uh, fake bank web portal that we created, but uh, uh, likely not as, as as many or as robust a security um, system that a lot of the uh, larger banks have, right? So, uh, but the hackers did believe uh, our uh, bank web portal to to be a real bank. Uh, and so many of them suggested using uh, bank trojans, and bank trojans uh, actually sold on a lot of these dark web sites. So they were uh, a lot of hackers were pointed to bank trojans uh, as a means of bypassing the security measures uh, that a lot of banks have in place. Right. So that was very interesting for us to see uh, not only uh, how how you know, a lot of these tools already exist, are already in place for bypassing uh, what we would consider normally pretty robust security measures, uh, but also that, uh, that hackers are very willing to, to share information as far as, you know, how to go about uh, uh, accessing this data using these bank uh, And then you had card writers, right? And uh, this is you know, this stems from our inclusion of real credit card numbers uh, on the uh, within the Google Drive account, right? We included, you know, we wanted it to uh, appear to be as real as possible, and so we put a number of files, encrypted and some decrypted files, with uh, real credit card numbers and uh, you know some fake customer information uh, to see just how many one how many customers' information would be breached, and two. Uh, if hackers would actually go to uh, to what length hackers would go to to decrypt these files, and so a lot of these hackers actually suggested uh, card writers and uh, went into great detail on uh, what data is needed to write these you know the the card information onto a a, a credit card uh, and how to go about using that card right so um, some very interesting information there. 
uh, and we go into great depth on that uh, uh, on our blog at, at blog.biglabs.com, uh, not only uh, these hacker tactics, but also the specifics of, you know, what these hackers were advising and, uh, and uh, you know, the best methods for uh, masking your identity uh, while also, you know, bypassing all the security measures that an organization might have in place uh, to protect its users, right? And not all uh, accounts um, are created equal in this respect, right? So you have, you know, bank trojans because these banks have fairly robust security measures, but perhaps you have sensitive data uh, in other accounts, sensitive data in Dropbox, sensitive data uh, as an organization in Salesforce uh, or in Office 365 or in Google Apps. Uh, and those don't have the same uh, level of security uh, that that a bank might have, right? So, uh, yes, bank trojans exist, but uh, it's also necessary to have uh, tools not just as a bank, but as another organization who uses a cloud app uh, to, to protect against these uh, very sophisticated hacker tactics. Uh, and uh, so someone just asked a, a quick question. The blog site is blog.biglabs.com. You can uh, check that out at, at biglabs.com. Uh, so a quick look at uh, a look back at where's your data. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the original experiment where we leaked files, documents, um, spreadsheets, and, and CSV files uh, onto the dark web and the surface web. And uh, what we discovered was, you know, we had hundreds of hackers access that data within the first few days, uh, download those files, uh, which we had marked as um, files related to, to a healthcare breach. Uh, and so we had, you know, 200 downloads within the first couple of days, uh, and then hundreds more in the following week. Uh, but that quickly tapered off, and all of those downloads were from the surface web, right? Uh, sites like... Uh, uh, you know, sites where you would, where, where you would host uh, some of these leaked files. Uh, but we also posted it onto the dark web. And uh, initially, as you can see here, uh, in, in February of, of 2015, we saw very little activity on the dark web, very few downloads from the dark web. Uh, but uh, what this really tells us is that, you know, once data is leaked, uh, it can always resurface, right? So, uh, after a, a long quiet period, very few downloads between February of 2015 and October uh, of 2015, uh, we saw a massive spike in downloads and, uh, you know, hundreds of downloads within a few days. Uh, and then in the following month, uh, we saw several downloads here and there as well. Uh, and uh, so this really shows that, that on the dark web, uh, one, that, that the data spreads in maybe different patterns than it would uh, on the surface web, right, whereas uh, on the surface web, most of the downloads were concentrated in the first few days. On the dark web, it actually uh, took some time to, to gestate, to, uh, to spread, to, uh, to, you know, find some, some legitimacy within these hacker circles, and uh, at a certain point, that, that exploded, and we saw a massive number of downloads from the dark web uh, and, and uh, uh, all downloaded via Tor, so a lot of these... Uh, IP addresses we couldn't uh, identify as coming from one country or another because uh, the, the tr they, these hackers are sophisticated enough to know uh, uh, on the dark web oftentimes that, uh, that the data is being tracked uh, and that their location uh, could be compromised if they don't take the appropriate security measures. So uh, this really goes to show how, you know, data, once it's, once it's out there, it's, it's, uh, it's out there permanently. And so... Uh, organizations have to take steps to uh, prevent the leak in the first place, right? And to, uh, once data is leaked, to identify that breach quickly and uh, be able to act on that and secure that data uh, however possible. So, uh, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll dive into sort of uh, some potential solutions here, uh, some recommendations that, uh, that we here at Big Glass have for uh, organizations looking to secure this data uh, to prevent similar breaches uh, and to uh, to you know protect from these sorts of uh, these hacks due to leak credentials. And so we at Big Glass, uh, as a cloud access security broker, believe that cloud access security brokers or CASBs 
uh, are the uh, ideal solution uh, for organizations looking to protect their data stored in these public cloud applications. Uh, and so we sort of see three pieces as key here, uh, especially um, given what we saw in Project Cumulus. Uh, there's the identity piece, uh, right, having a, sort of an integrated identity management solution in place uh, to ensure that uh, the people are who they say they are when they log into one of these cloud applications. Uh, the discovery piece, uh, being able to very quickly identify uh, risky behavior or activity uh, on the uh, within any cloud application and across all the cloud applications, right? Uh, you want the ability to to know, for example, uh, if someone had logged into both Salesforce uh, and uh, and Box from opposite coasts, right? You know that's not the same person, and you want to be able to have that discovery and that capability to understand uh, how your cloud application is being accessed and, and how the data in the cloud application is being accessed and used. Uh, across all these applications and have that sort of uh, uh, very fundamental understanding of, uh, you know, how how uh, to identify potential breaches and, and to uh, and and how your your employees are, are using data within your organization. And then there's the data centric security piece, uh, absolutely critical, uh, especially given given the results of Project Cumulus. Right, you had. Uh, you know, many, many hackers download these files off the Google Drive. Uh, and so, you know, when these files, uh, encrypted or decrypted, uh, have very sensitive data, right, customer information, uh, credit card numbers, you want to, to have data-centric security to be able to say, okay, well, um, because this has sensitive information, we don't want it to uh, be accessed outside the network, or we don't want it to be accessed from an unmanaged device. And so... Uh, you want to have that granular control uh, over those those sensitive files, and uh, that's very important, particularly uh, with these cloud applications, uh, where you want to enable your your workforce to have access from any device anywhere, uh, but you still want to protect the data itself. Uh, so we think these are sort of the, the three uh, key pillars uh, to preventing similar breaches and uh, all capabilities that a CASB like BigGlass uh, enables. So a bit more about uh, CASB identity, and so the, the big recommendation here is to uh, avoid reusing passwords. And uh, for uh, a lot of the IT folks on the line and uh, uh, folks who, you know, are, are uh, a little more tech savvy, they know not to reuse passwords across multiple sites. They know to use some sort of password management or, or what have you. Uh, but, uh, but for a lot of folks, that's not the case, right? A lot of folks just reuse the same password. Uh, not just uh, across cloud apps within an organization, but also outside the organization. And so, uh, you know, you, you might not have the same uh, control uh, over your your username and password uh, that uh, that an employee uses to access into a cloud application uh, if that if that same username and password are used elsewhere, right, or also used uh, on some you know unsanctioned service that, that happens to get breached. Uh, so you want to, as an organization, uh, not just uh, suggest or recommend that uh, that employees not reuse the passwords, but also uh, to implement better authentication, right? Uh, and so cloud app identity management is, is uh, very important here, right? You want to have uh, things in place like, like single sign-on to uh, enable cross-app visibility, to understand potentially suspicious activity, and you basically want to uh, have a, uh, an identity management solution that maintains the best practices uh, of, of on-premise identity, right? So um, across all these cloud applications, you want to, uh, you know, you want to have these, these features, things like single sign-on, things like multi-factor authentication, single-use passwords, uh, contextual multi-factor authentication, right? Um, and uh, the ability to understand, you know, uh, uh, how a, how a user is accessing uh, that cloud application. You know, you want to be able to say, okay, well, um, you know, this employee generally accesses uh, our cloud app from, you know, a, an iPhone and not an Android phone. So you want to uh, take action and be alerted to the fact that uh, an employee may be doing something that, that, that out of the ordinary 
uh, perhaps accessing data from a device that they don't normally access uh, that data from or from a, a location that they don't generally uh, frequent. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely critical that, uh, that organizations uh, implement this, this better authentication uh, so that you can not only understand, uh, you know, how your employees are, are accessing that data, but also so that you can know that they are who they say they are. And so that when you have situations like what we saw in Project Cumulus, uh, where credentials are leaked, uh, that when those credentials are used uh, in, a, in a location that, uh, that seems suspicious, right, if they're, you know, accessing that data from uh, China and you don't have a presence in China or Eastern Europe and you're uh, only based in the U.S., uh, perhaps that's suspicious activity that you want to be alerted to and that you want to act on. So uh, absolutely critical that that, uh, that that identity piece is in place so that you can uh, quickly, uh, you know, know that, 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 that folks are who they say they are, that uh, that it's not simply using a username and password to access a cloud application, but it requires more than that, right, with that you know, be it a, a hardware token for multi-factor auth or what have you. So we think discovery is, is a very important piece here as well. So um, the recommendation for organizations to avoid a situation like pro Project Cumulus is to uh, set up alerts for unusual activity. And so uh, what you want to do is you want to analyze these outbound flows to, uh, to understand what SaaS apps your, your organization is using, right? They may be using uh, a number of apps that are, that are unsanctioned. So you want to uh, have, a, have a good understanding of uh, the risks of all these cloud applications, right? And if they're accessing data that you believe to uh, or accessing an application uh, that you believe is, is maybe a risky application, one that may expose uh, some sensitive data of yours or uh, perhaps, you know, there's... Uh, a service they're visiting where they're uploading files, right? You want to be uh, quickly alerted to that. And so uh, you want to understand the risk profiles of different apps, right? Some apps are, are, uh, are more risky than others, right? You have things like YouTube that you uh, might want to be alerted to just because you can download mass amounts of data to that service uh, or upload mass amounts of data to that service, uh, whereas, uh, but that is a video service and perhaps you don't have uh, you don't see that as a risk, right? So, um, you know, we, we have these different risk profiles for these different applications, and uh, by setting up alerts with, with the CASB discovery solution, uh, you can understand the risk profiles of these different apps. Uh, we also see discovery as essential to, uh, to enable secure cloud app usage, right? So uh, you not only want to know... Um, that, that users are who they say they are with the identity piece. You not only want to uh, control access to sensitive files, you also want to understand how employees are using certain applications, right? And so uh, that, that visibility and that, uh, you know, really high-level understanding of what cloud applications are popular in your organization uh, are, are absolutely critical. And so you have some industries like, uh, like education where, most cloud apps are, are unsanctioned cloud applications, but you, you know, mass usage of, of services like Dropbox or, or Box or what have you, uh, and so organizations can can react to that. And when you have uh, discovery in place, you can uh, understand how users are using these different services and uh, and uh, and react in a way that uh, that provides users a great experience, but also uh, enables secure. Uh, cloud app usage. And there's granular access control and, and uh, data loss prevention. So this is uh, an absolutely critical piece, right? In Project Cumulus, uh, we saw, you know, many, many file downloads uh, with that sensitive credit card information that we've discussed. Uh, and so the, the new reality is, is that uh, that a new architecture is called for here, right? You don't have the, uh, the the manner in which employees access data today is not like the manner in which they accessed it, you know, five or ten years ago, right? You don't, uh, you, you oftentimes uh, employees want to be mobile. They want to access data from 
uh, any device anywhere you want. And you want to enable that. You want to enable the mobile workforce. Uh, you want to enable access from an unmanaged device in a Starbucks or, you know, uh, you know someone's personal iPhone or someone's personal Android phone on uh, whatever network. Uh, but perhaps you want to have, you know, control over the most sensitive data, right? So uh, maybe you give them access to uh, to corporate calendar, corporate contacts, but not to, uh, to you know, these sensitive credit card documents, right, Excel files. You can, and uh, with a cloud access security broker, what you can do uh, is apply granular policies uh to the, the data in a given cloud application. So uh, say the file that we had, uh, some of the files that we had in the Google Drive and Project Cumulus that had sensitive credit card data, uh, you can apply these, these uh, uh, pattern matching uh, and, uh, and understanding of, of regular expressions and all that uh, with DLP uh, to the files within that Google Drive. And, and uh, in doing so, you can feel safe and secure in knowing that if someone tries to download uh, a file that has credit card information in it, uh, that that DLP policy will be applied to that file, right? So uh, be that encryption uh, of the file, redaction, DRM requiring some sort of authentication from the user, uh, or, or you can, of course, block it entirely. Uh, and so it's really important that you have that granular DLP for data both at rest and data in motion, right? Data uh, that's in the cloud application itself and data once it's downloaded uh, to, uh, to a device, be that a managed or an unmanaged device. Uh, so what, what cloud access security brokers can do is, is offer uh, cross-device, cross-platform data protection. Uh, but something that's unique about the big cloud solution is that it's agentless data protection. Uh, so if you have an unmanaged device, uh, using the reverse and active sync proxies, uh, what Big Labs can do is, is uh, protect that data and uh, apply those policies to data once it's downloaded and uh, provide the end user with access uh, to a cloud application uh, without any profiles or certificates or any sort of, uh, you know, invasive NDM or MAM tools that, that, uh, that have existed in the past, right? So... Uh, this really enables secure BYOD uh, without um, sort of these, these invasive agents that, that uh, really hinder uh, adoption of BYOD programs. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's a great thing about the Big Glass solution and something that you can uh, leverage to, uh, to drive BYOD adoption in your organization uh, while ensuring that, that those cloud apps remain secure. And so all that cloud data, uh, as it flows, uh, you know, down to the device and, and when it's in the cloud, uh, in your, in your public cloud application, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's secure because you have these, uh, granular access control policies in place, right? You know, uh, who users are because they have authenticated, uh, themselves using, you know, multi-factor auth or, or uh, a single sign-on, uh, and, uh, so, the, so you know who they are, who they say they are. Uh, perhaps they're accessing from an unmanaged device, so you limit their access to certain uh, very sensitive data, uh, but you enable access from, from the uh, from managed devices or uh, devices on the network or, uh, uh, you know, devices that, that you don't necessarily uh, believe to be, uh, you know, risky devices or risky contacts, right, or contacts. So that contextual access control and understanding not only who is accessing that data, but uh, where they're accessing that data from and from what device they're accessing that data uh, is, is really important to understanding uh, and to acting uh, on, uh, on data in these cloud applications. And then you have things like uh, the forward proxy and the active sync proxy. And what these enable is, are, you know, things like access to, uh, well, you can, of course, have a managed device using some sort of profiler on the device. And you have, uh, with the active sync proxy, with that enables things like uh, native applications, native mail, native calendar, native contacts. Uh, and so all of these things are, are fantastic for, uh, for the end user, uh, and you, the end user gets all of these features uh, while the organization still uh, maintains that data-centric security. 
that we see as, as so critical uh, in, in protecting data in these cloud applications. And then you, of course, have detailed logging uh, for compliance and audit. Uh, we leverage APIs from, from all of these cloud applications, Salesforce, Office 365, Google Apps, uh, Dropbox, Box, uh, so that we can provide uh, customers here at BitGlass uh, and uh, with the with complete logs, with a complete you know understanding, deep visibility into uh, how users are, are using that data and um, and uh, you know who's accessing what data, right? And that's absolutely critical, uh, especially in highly regulated industries like financial services or healthcare, uh, that you have that uh, that uh, you know, detailed logging for compliance purposes. And so a little bit about Big Glass uh, before we wrap up here. Uh, you know, we offer total data protection outside the firewall. Uh, we were named a Gartner Cool Vendor last year, uh, founded in, in 2013, uh, and we have offices nationwide here in the U.S. And uh, we strongly encourage that, 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 you, uh, that you come and talk to us. Uh, we can provide, you know, a, a great solution for you uh, if you're looking for a cloud access security broker or a means to protect yourself from uh, the issues that we've talked about here today. Uh, with Project Cumulus, right? You have, you know, uh, the risk of uh, these hackers accessing credentials that are leaked. You have these risk of potential breaches. You have risky applications. Uh, you have, you know, issues of, of, of compliance. You need logs. You need access control. You need, uh, you know, deep, deep visibility uh, into uh, the data uh, in, in your cloud application. Uh, and so we as a cloud access security broker here at BigLabs can provide that, uh, can provide that agentless mobile security uh, so that you can enable secure BYOD while driving adoption. Uh, all, all great uh, solutions uh, here at BigLabs. So uh, do feel free to reach out to us. Uh, a few resources that we have in the attachments, uh, the Project Cumulus report, uh, Project Cumulus video overview, uh, and the definitive guide to cloud access security brokers. Uh, we encourage you to uh, to check those out. Uh, and so, and and with that, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we we always appreciate it. Uh, this reminder that this webinar was recorded, and we will uh, email the replay out for those who want to rewatch. Or you can always uh, find it at thickglass.com slash resources. Uh, reminder that those attachments are available for you to download, and we encourage you to check those out. Uh, please do feel free to uh, rate the webinar. We love to hear your feedback, and uh, uh, we'll be sure to uh, to incorporate that in the future. Uh, and uh, and with that, thanks for joining us. Do feel free to reach out on Twitter or via email at info at uh, and uh, and we'll see you next time.